Good morning and welcome to Sunday School at Second Baptist Church. I'm glad you could be with me today. We're continuing our study in Job and um, it's it, it still hasn't started to look up for Job yet, but um, let's see what we can learn today from the dialogue back and forth with his friends. When we ended last week, we were in Job chapter 14, and Job had said, um, you know, life is short, and at, right there at the end, he gave a little hope um, that even though uh, a tree gets cut down, sometimes it can sprout from the roots. And so he gave a glimmer of hope or that he had a glimmer of hope in his circumstance. And so our, our um, lesson today is going to go from chapter 19. And so for, from 14 to 19, then there's quite a bit of information. And I'm going to... Um, kind of summarize that. So in, in chapter 15, after Job talks about, um, you know, his situation and how he has a little bit of hope, then his friend Eliphaz speaks again. And Eliphaz says, um, basically, Job, you know, are you the only person that knows God and can hear from God? In verse 8, he says, Do you hear the secret counsel of God and limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? What do you understand that we do not? So, you know, he's he's rebuking Job and saying, You don't know more than us. You said that, you know, God uh, has done this and that you're an innocent man, but but we know more than you, or we know just as much as you. And then he goes on from there, starting in verse 17, to say, you know, I've lived a long time on the earth, and this is what I've seen. People that this kind of stuff happens to them, there's a reason for it. They've done something wrong. And so he continues on that line of saying, you know, that you must have done something wrong. And so in chapter 16, Job just I think he gets annoyed with the friends and he says um, in verse 2 he says to the friends sorry comforters are you all so he he just tells them you know you're not you're not being very good friends to attack me in this way and continue to attack me and say these things about me and then um, he's still in in verse 16, I mean chapter 16 and chapter 17, you know, he still maintains his innocence and also talks about how he's become just a byword, nothing, nothing to God. His spirit is broken and, um, and that sort of thing. So, you know, he's just in the pits and then the friends are jumping on him. I guess that's the way he feels about it, and that's sort of what's happening. And then in chapter 18, um, Bildad speaks again, and what he says is basically, you're, you are a wicked person, and you don't know God. Um, and so he, he just gets even worse with it, you know, with the things that, that he says to Job. I mean, they're, they're really being harsh um, on Job's situation. They're not looking at any other alternate alternative explanation except that Job, either Job, his children, or somebody has done something wicked, or else all of these things would not be happening. And so then we get to chapter 19. And that's where our, our study today is going to start in verse 19. But at the beginning of that chapter, Job responds again and just says, how, how long are you going to torment me and, um, you know, pick on me and say all of these things? Um, I shout for help, but there's no justice. God's breaking me down. 
he's removed my brothers far from me. Let's see where our verse starts. In, in verse 13 and 14, I want to read those particular verses. Now I'm in chapter 19 and verses 13 and 14. He says, He has removed my brothers far from me, and my acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My relatives have failed, and my intimate friends have forgotten me. Those who live in my house and my maids consider me a stranger. I am a foreigner in their sight. I call to my servant, but he does not answer. I have to implore him with my mouth. My breath is offensive to my wife, and I am loathsome to my own brothers. And then he goes on, you know, even young children despise me and, and things like that. And of course, we already know uh, what his wife thought because she made it clear, you know, she thought he ought to just go ahead and curse God and die. And then, you know, he feels abandoned at this point he says his brothers are far from him his acquaintances his friends you know these friends are not um sticking by him they are jumping on him you know his obviously his relatives have kind of steered clear of him even the servants are steering clear of him they don't you know want to come close to him and um just in every way he, he feels alone and abandoned. And so then we continue on that theme and let's go down to verse 19. So this will be Job 19, 19, and this is the first verse of our lesson today. And in verse 19, he says, All my associates abhor me, and those I love have turned against me. So, you know, this is the state that he's in now. He feels that everyone has hates him and has abandoned him or turned uh, against him. And you can see how he would feel that way. It's a terrible place to be in, not only to have that happening, but also then the physical agony that he was experiencing from all the boils that he has. And so in verse 20, he says, My bone clings to my skin and my flesh, and I have escaped only by the skin of my teeth. And interestingly, I, I did a little study on that phrase, by the skin of my teeth, because I wanted to see what the um, original Hebrew language put there, because that is like an idiom. You know, it, it, it doesn't, he doesn't really mean that his teeth have skin, or maybe he does, I don't know, but you can imagine if your teeth had skin, they would, that would be the thinnest skin possible. So he's, what, you know, what the idiom means, we all know, is that it was, it's a narrow escape. Only by the slimmest of margins has he escaped death. And that's the way he feels. But the origin of the phrase, when I did some study on it, no one predates this phrase prior to it appearing here in Job. And so I'm sure that it was a phrase that was, that was spoken at that time. Who knows when it started being said. Um, you know, but it is a it is an ancient phrase that we repeat. But the earliest written record of that phrase is right here in the book of Job, where we we see it. So there's not an earlier record of it in any other ancient writings or anything like that. So he he feels that he's escaped by the very narrowest of margins. And then let's read verses 21 and 22. Pity me, pity me, O you, my friends, for the hand of God has struck me. Why do you persecute me as God does and are not satisfied with my flesh? So he's asking his friends now, please just, just pity me. Can't you put yourself in my shoes and feel sympathy for me but you're taking the place of God and you're sitting in judgment on me rather than feeling sympathy for me 
And, you know, maybe the friends felt uh, that if they, if this could happen to Job, an innocent man, if he were innocent and this had happened, then that may be discomforting to them to think that, okay, what if I'm innocent and God decides to do something to me? And so, you know, it may shake the, the foundations of their faith, I guess, to, to think along those lines. And that may be the reason why they feel that they have to sit in judgment on Job. You know, there has to be a reason because otherwise something like this could also happen to them. You know, and so a lot of times people, they are thinking of their own maybe self-interest, their own agenda, or the, they might not even realize that they're doing that in a response that they give you or in a way that they treat you, you know, because it somehow serves a purpose for them. And that's just the way we are as humans. We are, we're very self-centered and very selfish, I guess, in a lot of ways. You know, we can't, it's very hard for us to put ourselves in the other person's shoes. And that's something we ought to practice, you know, a lot more often so, so that we do have sympathy for people. And so Job says, you know, are you not satisfied with my flesh? You know, you might say, is it not enough that my flesh is suffering here? You know, that you've got to also not have pity on me. And then in verses 23 and 24, uh, he says, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. That with an iron stylus and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. Now, so Job is now going to make a statement. And I think these are the words that he wishes were inscribed in a rock or in a stone. Permanently inscribed somewhere. Or that he, the words are written down. And this is what he says then in verses 25 to 27. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my flesh, I'm sorry, even after my skin is destroyed. Yet from my flesh, I shall see God. Whom I myself shall behold and whom my eyes will see, and not another. My heart faints within me. So now Job has made a statement. He wishes that this statement could be written in stone so that people could remember that Job said it. When he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. So Job has had a revelation of some sort to be able to say this because before you know he was saying am I just going to be cut down and never return or never be again but now he's saying some very different things and so he's begun to feel in his heart or God has spoken to him to say these things um to express that he knows that his Redeemer lives, that at the last uh, day or, you know, at the, at the end, he will take his stand on the earth, that even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. So, he, Job has the idea that even though he dies, his flesh is destroyed, or his skin is destroyed, yet still, in the flesh, he's going to see God. Uh, he's going to behold him in, in verse 27. He says, I myself will behold him, and whom my eyes will see and not another. So he's saying, in person, I'm going to see God. In the flesh, in person, I'm going to see him. My heart faints within me. It, you know, just the thought of it. The very thought of it just just uh, makes him feel faint. 
to to think about it but but i think this is a revelation you know that that job has expressed and you know it goes back to there's a couple of things back in the earlier part of the old testament there was this idea of a redeemer which could be a kinsman redeemer who could help you in time of trouble when maybe you got into monetary trouble or something like that where you were losing your land uh, because of money a kinsman redeemer could come in and and purchase the land and get it back for you, you know, and that sort of thing. And so there's this idea in the earlier part of the Old Testament about um, a redeemer within your within your kinsmen, particularly. And now, you know, we know in the book of uh, Esther. No, no, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. In the book of Ruth, where Ruth goes to Boaz and he becomes her redeemer that um he is a i think a distant you know kinsman and he becomes her redeemer and it's a, a sort of a reflection of future things to come when jesus the messiah you know becomes our redeemer and even though job here may be speaking of god as his redeemer but who knows? I mean, Job may have had a vision or a revelation from God that said, you know, a Redeemer is coming, a, a Messiah. It may actually be a Messianic proclamation. And, of course, it always, I love this verse because um, it's a part of the Messiah. When You know, I've, I've sung the Messiah a lot of times when we lived in Africa there was a community chorus and every year they would sing the Messiah and I joined the community chorus and I would sing with them and the, you know there's a part of well a lot of the Messiah is uh, verbatim you know scripture straight from the, the Bible and this particular verse is there I know that my Redeemer lives and on the earth he shall stand at the latter day you know it's it's a very direct quote that's in the in the um that music the messiah okay let's go on i was chasing a rabbit there so in verses 28 and 29 uh he's speaking now and he's still you know he's speaking to the friends but this is his statement that he's made about the redeemer and then he says in 28 and 29 if you say how shall we persecute him and what pretext for a case against him can we find? Then be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, so that you may know there is judgment. So he's saying to the friends here now in, in these verses, you know, if you feel like you've got to bring a case against me, you've just got to figure out some way that I'm guilty that I've sinned and deserve these things that are happening, if you feel like you've got to do that, then you better watch out because, um, you know, wrath brings the punishment of the sword so that you may know there is judgment. Because what he's saying is God is the judge. God is the one who brings punishment at the end of time and you know if we sit in judgment on people and try to pick them apart uh, with our gossip or our you know analogies or whatever we pick them apart and we criticize them then we need to be careful because we're putting ourselves in the place of being a judge and God is the judge you know and I mean this is for all of us it, it's for me and for everybody you know to consider in our lives because you know it's it's easy to sit back and 
throw stones at someone else or to um, point out the faults of others because if you do that it somehow in some weird way it makes you feel better about yourself like I'm not like them you know I don't have the faults that they have but we certainly have our own set of faults don't we a lot of them and and we make mistakes we all do and so all of us should think you know and take an example from these friends of how to be compassionate to other people and not judge and not uh, not look for the faults and the cracks you know in other people um so that's the end of our lesson for this time now the next lesson is going to come from chapter 28 so again we're going to jump forward and in uh, chapter 28 is where we'll find ourselves so if you want to continue to read ahead through Job, then um, you'll be ready for that next lesson. Thank you for joining me. I look forward to seeing you again.